I want to start with this, <clears throat> and that is that um, you may have seen this scene. And then a couple of days later, her father got transferred to Florida in July. Movies often portray therapy as a money-making scheme that really doesn't help people. Um, one of my favorites that I often um, have looked at, if you really look at, analyze this, Billy Crystal and Robert De Niro takes therapy and puts it on its head. And unfortunately, therapists in the community are, prepared, are presented, and often in the media, as ineffective. And I think in this group, you know, if you look around the room, you have people who have been in recovery for a long time, and in fact, hold leadership positions in national 12-step networks in this room. You have certified sex addiction therapists, some of whom have been at it for a long time. And you have professional therapists who own clinics. We have people who work in inpatient settings. And um, yet you're all here to learn, to, to improve your skills, thinking about this. What the question is that's out there is, does treatment work? And does it work for sex addiction? And the question really comes up that we've been at this for a long time and there's a lot of people in this room who have a lot of experience about this, but we need to step back and think about how do people answer this question, how do you, how do we deal with these cascades of understanding that we're designing into recovery, what we've been talking about at this conference? And <clears throat> one of the things that I remember, one of the things that I remember is a time in my life, this was a moment of insight for me. Out of the Shadows had been out for about a year and a half. And the first inpatient program had appeared for sex addiction. 
group of us who'd worked on that, the launch of it, getting the medical staff on board, building any kind of program that's a first in the nation. That was in 1985. And it was kind of a, we just had a milestone because we had literally opened in January and were already at 54 patients. So people were feeling really proud. And we're all sitting at lunch there and I'm listening to people talk and chatter and what have you. And how much that they that we've, what a, what a milestone that was. And it hit me. We don't know. We built this thing. We think it'll work. We don't know. And that the real challenge for me, in terms of my own moments of courage, was the realization sitting there and saying, holy cow, we got to go and do something bigger. And so I started a research project, which took seven years, and a thousand sex addicts and their families. And we had an instrument that we had them fill out. And it um, took eight hours to do. And the reality is that if you think nationally, to find a thousand sex addicts to sit down and fill out something for eight hours was no mean achievement. <laughs> and they would ended up doing it in groups because they found it helpful to fill it out and talk. There was so little at the time. And what they did is then they, um, we followed them. And in addition to that data, and we still have all this, each spouse and addict, as part of their deal, were interviewed, and all that was tied up, typed up. And on the average, they were manuscripts of 100 pages. So we have, just counting the addict, 100,000 pages of their testimony <laughs> of what happened to them over time and of their spouses, and I still have all that stuff. So we, we distilled out of it the reality that emerged is that where there were certain things that if they did, they got better, and then if, if they didn't, they didn't. And we took the people who had real success, and they're about, of a, as a cohort, about 97% of them really got a really good sobriety going. But what we learned from that is not only what they had to do, but kind of the order in which things had to happen. And so what came out was there were sort of six stages that people went through in their therapy in order for it to work. And <clears throat> These six stages represent a process that people would go through. And the first one was a sort of a developing stage in which people realized that they had a problem. But usually they weren't ready to do anything about it yet. But there was a kind of a pre-recovery stage. There was a moment and one of those transformational moments of insight Something would happen and a person would realize, I can't go like this anymore. I literally cannot stand living with myself. And when that happened, and that can happen in a single day, a single moment, sometimes take up to a couple weeks or even three months, so it's a rocky whitewater period in their lives. But out of it, there was kind of, as they started to make, they made the commitment to get help, there's a um, stage of shock, a can't believe I did that. It was so foreign from who I am. And there's also an anger that occurs at that, that time because everything I believed is in turmoil. And in addition to that, 
as the anger would wear off, the addict and the family, there is a grief period. A little bit like we were talking about earlier. To get to a point of forgiveness, to get to a point where you have acceptance, it, there's a cost to that. There are losses that have occurred. And there's a deep grieving period. That grieving period is a period also of, of immense insight. And flowing out of that is a period of repair work that takes literally what we, at the time, we saw it as about a two to three year period. And <clears throat> the fact is that at the time we didn't understand it. Now, understanding as much about the brain as we do, we get this period There's, that the brain is really working on that, but in digesting all the changes that have to occur. And then finally, person's relationships start to change. So as Henri Nouwen would talk about, as we were talking about his book earlier, he says that this, the stages literally were about as the addict starts to have a connection with the self, that they become trustworthy, they start trusting other people, their relationships go through extraordinary transformation. Over the years, we translated that, first of all, into kind of specific tasks that therapists could learn. And that was the beginning of the whole certified sex addiction therapist program. And what a CSAT knows and is helpful with in a community, a community clinic or in the treatment centers, is they know what a sex addict can do to get better. That CSAT community becomes a resource. One thing I've heard over and over in the years, many of you have heard the same thing. I had to go through five therapists before I found one that really understood what I was doing. And I see a lot of nodding heads, and that is exactly what happens. My way of looking at it, though, because one of the things very early for me that became clear from a neuroscience point of view. There's two things that in order for someone to change their brain is one, they have to have safety. In other words, it's why 12 steps work, is that um, it's like in treating torture victims. Amnesty International found out that you wouldn't start therapy until you're with people who have had the same experience. And the second thing is story. It's all about story. Those people who discovered and put together the steps in 1935 discovered a major part of why recovery would work and why the brain does what it is. Today we talk about narrative therapy and how you are resetting up synapses in the brain literally because the story changes. So the fact is, it's getting at that story. And so what I was really attracted to is Joseph Campbell's notion of the hero's journey. And we have talked about that in here in our community and lots of my writing reflects that because I, what I wanted to do is the hero's journey is really the human story of change. And when somebody walks into a treatment center, it is a really story of great courage. So we've used these metaphors because sometimes a patient will get that metaphor when they won't get the therapy. <laughs> they can make the leap because they hear the story and say, it's supposed to be hard right now. That makes sense to me. I'm supposed to resist this. Kind of undermines the resistance. And so it helps in the process. So we use the heroic journey of starting in innocence, and then you get a call, and the changes that occur of going through the ordeal of therapy and of breakthroughs. And an important part about all this is about the release of creativity. And we've known for some time that addicts use their brains 
like some of the great creators, artists, writers, musicians. This is why so many of our talented leadership, business leadership, our political leadership are very vulnerable to addictions is because they have a creative mind. And we had talked this morning about the shadow call, the shadow profession, the shadow music, but it's not really, there's no risk to it. It's not really bringing me, bringing me into that period of struggle that makes me that better person. So we have used that for some time to help people. And I look at, I tell our patients when they come in at the Meadows, I say, this is a hall of heroes. And we are now in a place where we have networks of CSATs. We have the numbers of treatment centers who are doing this work. And the reality is, they're all halls of heroes. And that what, what the community is doing is calling people in that they can really make a difference in their life and it, and it does work. But in the last, so I started in 1985 in that, in terms of building treatment centers and being involved with treatment centers and training therapists and what have you. Compared to where we were in 1985 and where we were, say, in 2005, huge difference. Skill level, all of that, and a lot of people practicing, using the same playbook, and then comparing, seeing who gets how things can get better. That's the value of us working together. It's the value of a CSAC community. It's a value about the treatment community. However, in the last four years, years, some things have happened that have changed everything. We have entered an extraordinarily new era. The reasons that have drawn that in the field of sex addiction, the internet has become such a driver of human sexuality. What we're seeing in patients, really different. And one of the questions, of course, we've talked about often amongst ourselves is the reality is that two-thirds of our kids are being sexual on the internet. Their parents do, don't know. 34% of them are going to go on to have a lifetime problem. But here's the part that's new. We now know that 40% of those kids, 6 million kids in North America, start at the age of 10 or earlier. Uh, we had a patient not long ago who told me the story that the way that he started on the internet at the age of seven is he discovered his father's stash, immersed himself in what his father was looking at and was off to the races on the internet. The internet's changed everything. So it means that how we respond to patients, the typical ways that people became a sex addict, is changing. And our culture has a huge problem. Because nobody knows how do you set up treatment programs for people who are 10 years old about this. It's one of the things the American Foundation for Addiction Research is really looking at, is about how do we help clinicians with protocols and ways of thinking about working with kids. The other major change is this, and it really started in the middle 70s when we started to understand what goes on in the brain, and then by the year 2000, that map became more clear, and by 2005, globally, Neuroscientists, a very famous lecture by a man named Nistler, the Royal Academy in 2005, summarizing the history of neurobiology and what he called the natural addictions and how that has got to be taken into account because they're often paired with the chemical addictions. Unless you treat them all, 
you're not going to have the success that you need to. That's 2005. In 2008, a major article appeared, 94 pages, showing all the ways that the decision-making processes of the brain have been affected. And there are 10 different ways the brain can be accessed by addiction. And different addicts will do it different ways. And so, very clearly, what we knew by 2008, 2009, American Society for Addiction Medicine started working on it, that it's a brain disease, and we know what happens in the brain, and it's important for us to really see how, and we start seeing brain scans in the last 18 months, year. Brain scans. University of Berlin, Cambridge University, articles in the Journal of the American Medical Association. All of this is very confusing to our critics because you're getting good science coming out and saying, hey, it's a brain problem. You watch four hours of porn a week, your gray matter sh shrinks in your brain because when the brain sees a neural pathway into the reward centers of the brain, sees it as a matter of survival and it cannibalizes from the rest of the brain and it affects the bottom part of the brain in which learning, memory, motivation, all those things get altered. It interferes with the functioning. So you have, I am seeing kids in their late 20s, failure to thrive because they're, they've been using pornography since age 12 and they are not, their frontal lobes are not functioning. They can't make it to class on time. They can't hold a job. So the fact of the matter is, what we have is we have in the last couple years, to raise the bar about what happens in treatment and what happens in recovery. And the principles is part of that. Principles, looking at the 12 steps and looking at, you know, creating a way. If you went to all the meetings you qualified for, you'd never have a life. <laughs> so what you need is a place that can, you can consolidate your work and really intensify what it means to live, live a life of recovery. Now, what does that neurobiology, as we are starting to understand it, how does that affect then treatment, living a recovery life? How can we learn from that? And what I'm saying is that now in both recovery, even in recovery rooms, we need to be good consumers of healthcare information. If you get cancer, you start learning about what it does, what options are, you start, doing, you start living differently. If you have a chronic illness, you try to figure out what that is. Well, that's what recovering people have to do. And the treatment centers, whether on the outpatient basis or the inpatient basis, have to be thinking differently. So we tie the story into those six pages, or six stages, but also now we need to think about from applauding that, what we now know, what works in treatment, from understanding also the brain in treatment and recovery. This is a book that I'm recommending to you because it's got a good example, a good way of summarizing a lot of the work that's been going on the last two decades. Um, Norman Dodge wrote a book, The Brain That Heals Itself, and this particular book is called The Brain's Way of Healing. And what he says is that there are definite phases the brain goes through, and I wanna match those up to the things that we were talking about in the conference here. And so he says that in almost all therapy, outpatient, inpatient, what have you, there are certain problems. The first is that there's a problem of non-use or dysfunctional wiring. 
In other words, in non-use, uh, non-use would be an example. Um, if you're on the internet and you are so exposed, one of the concomitant, you see all the stimulation on the internet, being able to be sexual with a partner becomes difficult. Erectile dysfunction, varieties of ways that a person's sexual functioning becomes impaired. And part of it then is that you focus on the internet and you do not focus on the sexuality with your partner. That's a, there's a set of neurons that don't get used. Does that make sense? I mean, it's like it's dormant. And if it goes on for years, activating that again takes some time and refocusing can be done. But when you start, that thing is now unavailable, hasn't been used. The other thing that goes on is um, dysfunctional wiring, where what you think about becomes a rabbit hole. And, um, and we talk about that as an error code. And my, the metaphor we use is the out of a beautiful mind um, in the movie, a uh, Nobel Prize winner is talking about his mental illness and he says, I, need, I needed to learn how to ignore my brain because he recognized that his brain had an error code in it. That when he thought that way, it brought him to a bad place. And so it is really dismantling that error code. But when you're starting, you got that wiring and you have non-use. You also have what we call a noisy brain. And the noisy brain is about, literally, so much stimulation sexually, if it's a sex addict, but it can be any kind of addict. And the other part is, usually there's a lot of chaos then in the addict's life. And all the stimulation of trying to solve problems, there's managing secrets, there's kids who are upset, there's business problems, and the brain is so stimulated that it can't focus on anything. That's where you're starting, is there's no focus. And then finally, one of the things, and it was brought up earlier this morning, the self doesn't rely on a single cell. The neural networks of the brain are a grid. It's a grid. Our self rely on the electrochemical interactions that float on that grid. And so in there, those interaction, those little patterns that float around and don't reside there, they have a lot of parallels and they have beliefs about men, women, sex, children, religion, what have you, and they all kind of network together and they block thinking. It's where the error codes reside. And so you have, have this, these coded networks in which the patterns of the self are carried in neural networks. It's interesting to think about that about it because it sounds so fragile. I mean we seem to do pretty well but it's, it's not solid like you can cut this up and say this is where it is. So <clears throat> what Dodge says is there's five things the brain does that makes things better. And the very first thing he says that has to happen for anybody. Now, I want to go back and just tie this into something you brought up this morning in that kind of spiral where you keep encountering it over and over again. So this process Sometimes in your life, you simply have to stop and do it all over again in order to regenerate a process of taking you to the next level. So whether you did it initially at the beginning of recovery, I want to suggest to you as part of the principles, we, we will find moments where maybe we have to do some of these things. But initially, one of the things he says is you have to correct the cellular functioning of the brain. Sugar, toxins, 
things that are toxic to the brain, chemicals. So for example, we get patients that are on heroin or cocaine or alcohol or marijuana and it's combined with sexual activity. So we're not just gonna focus on the sexual activity, we're gonna take those toxins away. So it has to be in the new age where a treatment center has to be able to look across addiction, and we use the term addiction interaction. And the fact is, these addictions help each other. They're glued together molecularly. And so we often are detoxing people from chemicals, but also you have to understand there's kind of a sexual detox too, because that stimulation, the reward center of the brain is used to getting. So if you're gonna mix chemicals with the processes, you gotta do both of those things to get the brain ready so that it can get some traction. Then the issue that comes up is all the neuro stimulation necessary to start stimulating brain growth. Exercise. Everything you do for your heart, you do for your brain. And you start therapy in which you do processes which undermine the grid of understandings. The, the insight that stops you cold in your tracks and says, you hear another person in your group say it, you hear something your therapist says, but it like drills through your heart and you say, my God, that's true of me. Or I've never thought of that before, but that's why this happens. In other words, thoughts, transformational thoughts that change the grid. And you do that fairly early in treatment. And then you have neuromodulation. Now this is a big word, but what it means is this. You have two different nervous systems, a parasympathetic nervous system, and you have a sympathetic nervous, nervous system. The way in treatment now you have to deal with is that you gotta calm things down. The first is to work with the arousal side and to reduce the arousal, learning how the tools to do that, but on the other side, how to calm the self. Both of those activities have to go on where you learn, and it's, so it's a deliberate, planned, series of strategies to help work with the brain to get it to a place where it can be open then. And one of the things Dodge says needs to happen is that the brain needs to relax. So um, I work in an inpatient setting. I think those of us who work in inpatient see this, you get to a point where the person starts to look different. <laughs> they, they, they are uh, just how they are. And, and then they come back to you, they're able to sleep. Things start coming up that they weren't even thinking when they started. And it's because the brain has had a chance to start digesting, it has to catch up with itself. And so part of, I mean, reasons that people come to treatment usually in an inpatient setting is because they couldn't do it on an outpatient setting. They couldn't get sober, stay sober, uh, they became suicidal or there were so many legal complications, whatever it was. But what has to happen is they have to be in a safe enough place so that this relaxation period occurs so the brain can process and engage so all this information that has never really been examined. They've been put on the shelf. The final thing in, then is neurodifferentiation. And what that means is, this is where you are able to take the knowledge that is starting to emerge, the things where your cherished beliefs, your hardening of the categories, if you will, has been disrupted. And the brain has now got skills on board where you can focus and really bear down, parsing out and putting the dots together and say, ah oh, yes, 
So you have a firm understanding that now becomes the bulwark to not going back to the way you were. And that is a hard, disciplined piece of work that takes daily focus to do. And we use the phrase mechanisms of attention. That's what we teach. And from a, an achievement point of view, I mean, we get people of great achievement. We need to help them move into healthy focus away from preoccupation which keeps people in their shadow careers and in their toxic states. So this is my effort. I took a look at those six stages that we talked about, that we know for years about this, you know, that people get well. And then when you stretch it, we can see the, the things that start at the beginning of, of a process, non-use, a noisy brain, coded networks, and then when they start therapy, they have to start helping their brain become healthy, stimulating it in ways that helps them to think differently, learning how to modulate their reactions, calming as well as, you know, putting a lid on some of the reactivity. Achieving that period where the brain can actually relax and allow itself to percolate so you can rise to a new level. And then the final thing, that whole last moving out of pain into repair and growth is the process where you take your newfound focus and you really start dividing things up and you parse it up and make, make more sense of your world. So the issue here is, I think recovery and 12-step communities and treatment centers and outpatient therapy, we're at a new level of understanding how the brain starts doing that. And key to that is what we have been talking about here. The epiphany moment when I have that insight. How do we promote, both in a 12-step meeting and in a therapy process, the cascades of realizations the ways that the old delusions don't have the power that they used to have. How do we muster up the courage to really enter a process which is transformational? We've been talking about the fear of doing this, fear of going and if the call to live your life differently. And, and I think about this, and the phrase when we started this conference, what was brought up to you is the idea of sitting in a doctor's office and you get a diagnosis of terminal illness like a stage four cancer. Suddenly your priorities change. How you spend your time, you only spend time in things that matter. And that's kind of like what has to happen because this is the, a, d a disease, brain disease of addiction, literally can, we can treat that. We're developing a whole new bar about how that can happen. Big change in our field, but it's also validating what we did before. Now we can be more precise about it. So that's there. But a way of thinking about this is you, if you're sitting there and you're trying to think about whether you can get help or not, the question I would ask, and I bet every person here in this room would say, they would say yes to. If you saw a child, four or five years old, running out into a street, and that child was gonna get killed or hurt or maimed or what have you, and there's no other adult around, you're gonna run out there and grab that kid before that kid's in trouble. There's no person in this room who would not put their body on the line for that kid. Now you have to stop and think about that. This kid you don't know, but our instinct would be to take action, be courageous, and it's in a nanosecond. You don't have to make that decision. So then, when it's you 
that needs help. When you're not matching up to what you know that you should be doing, personal life, call, what have you, it's about why won't you do that for yourself? Give this whole hearted effort that is required to make something happen to do that for yourself. And I think for listeners out there that might be thinking about this decision in their life right now of making a choice to get to a meeting, to get to a treatment program, to get some help. You'd save a kid, but can you save yourself? Thank you.